Around six weeks ago, a whole group of people, some of whom are in the room, uh, met for four days in and around Palankaraya. And I just want to give you a little background about that process before we get underway. And, and to do that, I'm going to, in a moment, invite uh, Gary Dunning, the Executive Director of the Forest Dialogue, with whom C4 partnered, to explain the context of the Food, Fuel, Fibre and Forests Dialogue. And then we'll hear from a number of people who were participants in that dialogue about their perspectives. Once we've done that, we'll move to the tables and uh, have two short, intense bursts of discussion about experiences that we all have relevant to these issues and we'll aim to wrap up a little ahead of schedule by seven o'clock. It's been a long day. We don't want to keep people waiting. But I've uh, overlooked introducing myself, Ma'af. I'm uh, Peter Konoski. I'm the Deputy Director General for Science at C4 and it was my privilege to uh, act as a coordinator for C4 in the collaboration with the Forest Dialogue. So let me introduce Gary Dunning, the Executive Director of the Forest Dialogue, to give you the global context for this initiative before we move to talk about our learning from Kalimantan. Thank you, Peter. And good afternoon, everybody. I'm happy to welcome you all on behalf of the Forest Dialogue to this afternoon's session. And again, to acknowledge and um, uh, to say that we appreciate uh, the collaboration that we've had with C4 in putting uh, not only the Central Kalimantan Dialogue together, but also this afternoon session. As Peter said, we're hoping that this session will be a little bit interactive, a little bit more of a discussion uh, before we do that. There's a couple things uh, by way of context and background that I'd like to share with you. So as Peter said, I'm the Executive Director of the Forest Dialogue. The Forest Dialogue was an organization, is an organization, that was started um, about 14 years ago. The idea behind the Forest Dialogue is to create a platform and process for stakeholders that care about forests to discuss the challenging issues, to build trust, to share information, and ultimately to help change some of the, the challenges that we see in the forest sector. We've been doing that for about the past 14 years, as I said, and we work on a variety of issues. There's many, as you all know, there's many different issues in the forest, and we have a process and a steering committee that helps us focus on the key issues and develop initiatives around those issues. We're going to talk about one of those issues today, and, and that is our 4Fs, Food, Fuel, Fiber, and Forest Initiative. More information at all, at all the tables, so if you're sitting in the back, eventually we're going to ask you to come to the tables, but um, there's more information on the Forest Dialogue at the tables. This is our brochure that talks about all the various initiatives, talks about how we do our work. Our work is, as the name suggests, based on interactive multi-stakeholder dialogue processes, and as um, Peter said, uh, we bring people into the field to experience certain challenges and then we talk through how we can help collaboratively work on those challenges in the field but also internationally. The Forest Initiative grew out of um, the challenge that our steering committee identified of this, what we're calling the uh, pressurized intersection of food, fuel, uh, and fiber over the next 20 to, to 40 years. And it's that challenge about choosing which land use practices, which resources, which commodities, which livelihoods. That is the challenge that we have to face over the next 40 years. How do those decisions get made? How do we approach a more integrated landscape decision-making process? That's why the Forest Dialogue created the 4Fs initiative.
basically, the initiative is um, comprised of, of these organizations, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development, C4, CCAFS, Climate Change, Agriculture and Food Security, IIED, which is the International Institute for um, Environment and Development, WWF, the FAO, and the World Bank. These are the partners that came together to help develop the focus of the 4Fs initiative. And these three aspects of the initiative are, are what we came up with as a focus. The engage, explore, and change. As you can see, that's kind of a central theme of the Forest Dialogue. By the engage aspect, we mean to create and develop multi-stakeholder dialogue, dialogue processes, and that, again, essentially is what the Forest Dialogue does. So by creating these engagement processes, both internationally and locally, Forest Dialogue is bringing these partners as well as others, many, many others, um, to the table to discuss these 4Fs issues. There's the explore aspect that's looking at creating a, a, a research agenda around the questions related to integrated landscape management. Um, how do you do land use decision making? How do you optimize the process? C4 is obviously the lead partner in, in that as is IID and some of the other uh, partners that we work with. And finally, there's the change phase or the change aspect of this. And ultimately, all these institutions are interested in the, in the, in the change aspect uh, as it relates to the 4F. And, and ultimately, we're looking at improving land use decision making on the ground. That is what this initiative is focused on. So what have we done so far? Uh, the Forest Dialogue has convened three international dialogues on the issue of 4Fs. Um, the first one was a what we call a scoping dialogue, and, and that took place in Washington, D.C. Uh, in 2011. That was a group of about 30 experts coming together to talk with us about what is what are the key issues as we develop this initiative, what are the key aspects um, that we look at when we're in the field, what, it, what are the, the opportunities for change that we think we can work towards through a collaborative process. And then we held a field dialogue in Brazil in 2012 and a field dialogue in, in Indonesia in 2014, actually it was just last month as Peter mentioned. In Brazil we looked at the a soy based, uh, soy and livestock based uh, landscape and how those decisions were being made about which commodities kind of took precedent in the landscape, which actors were a part of that process. So in a way we're looking at what is the current situation, what, it, what are the current decision making uh, processes in place, who are the actors that, that are leading those processes, deconstructing that a bit and then trying to understand how those process how those processes might be able to be improved. That was in Brazil. Um, on, I'll note that all the tables have these USB sticks on them, and uh, if you don't, we'll make sure you have some. There's one table that doesn't. Um, on here are the, the reports from these dialogues. You can read more in much more detail about um, what our findings were. We're going to spend most of our time today, all of our time really today, looking at Indonesia. Um, but those other reports, uh, you can access those. In Indonesia, we were looking at a, a palm oil dominated landscape in central Kalimantan, but also the effects of mining and rubber and, and, um, and red in, in land use decision making processes and, and how those were affected and impacted the decisions that were made. Uh, the next location for our international dialogue on 4Fs will be in Finland. And in Finland we're going to be looking at, at bioenergy as the lead driver of, of land use decision making of commodity driven development in, 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 in Finland and that will be uh, next month, uh, sorry, in September. So, again, we're going to focus much more on specific findings in Indonesia, and Peter is going to uh, pick that up in a minute. 
But I just wanted this last slide just to give you an idea of some of the major findings or general issue topics that, that we are focusing in now after, after the two dialogues. Some of this, I think those of you that work kind of in the landscape context, I think this will make a lot of sense to you and, and things that, that you're seeing as well. Um, first and foremost, of course, the pri when you t talk about integrated landscape approach, the private sector is key in that process. Having the private sector fully engaged, but engaged at a table that have other stakeholders there as well is, is absolutely essential. Enabling conditions need to be in place for a successful kind of integrated landscape approach. Um, in this particular case, enabling conditions such as capital for small, medium-sized enterprises, um, participatory decision-making processes in place, uh, public policies that are conducive to this kinds of these kinds of engagement and participatory approach. Um, all the all the actors in the supply chain need to be part of this process as well. So although you may be talking about a specific landscape, that landscape impacts, and there's a lot of actors that impact that landscape. So all the actors, all the way from production to consumption, need to be engaged in this process. And finally. Um, we need to, particularly those of us in the forest sector, this is a very important and very challenging, um, big challenge for us, and that is to work outside the sector, and particularly to work with our colleagues in, in the agriculture sector. Um, that is for us in this process and in, in, in the development of the 4Fs initiative, that's probably been, been one of our biggest challenges. We find that the, the dialogue process that we've become used to in the forest sector is not necessarily present um, in the ag sector. So bringing them into this process uh, in a way where they can fully engage, feel comfortable, and trust the process has been a bit of a challenge for us. So reaching across sectors uh, is something that we uh, need to do and, and are working on. And finally, let me say that um, our 4S initiative is evolving into a, a we don't really have a, a firm focused title, but a more integrated landscapes model. And from, for, for us, what that means, the Forest Dialogue historically has gone to countries and dialogued and worked with local stakeholders and then went on to the next country. And, Local stakeholders sometimes pick up those dialogues and continue them. We have examples of that in Brazil. Uh, we're hoping that similar processes will take root here in Indonesia. But one of the things that this initiative, the 4S initiative, 4Fs initiative, is considering is, is creating more of a permanent platform, a, 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 a longer term kind of platform in specific landscapes where over time we can build the knowledge and build a platform where it's integrated learning and, uh, and, and the partners can work <coughs> collaboratively in specific locations. But that is in the process now of development, and so I won't really go much further into that. So with that, Peter, that's, um, that's the overview and context for the 4Fs. And any of the information that you want will be on the Forest Dialogues website, of course, the 4Fs information on the USB drives, and please follow us on the Twitter and uh, other social media. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Um, for those who have just come in, welcome. Thanks for joining us. That was Gary Gunning, Executive Director of the Forest Dialogue. I haven't got enough hands, so you can click it, please. Um, I also want to introduce our team Wei, sitting over here, um, also from the Forest Dialogue Secretariat at Yale University. So if you have questions about what the Forest Dialogue do, you can tweet Gary or Xiao Ting, or you can come and say hello to them face to face and they'll respond. Uh, they're here for both days. I'm Peter Konoski, uh, one of the Deputy Directors at C4, and I'm moderating uh, this afternoon's session. What I'd like to do now is stand out of your way so you can see the screen and just give you a little uh, brief background about the field dialogue that 70 of us participated in in central Kalimantan six weeks ago. Could I go a few slides on? Thanks. So um, uh, Gary's talked about the 
objectives for the 4Fs process generally, and so we refined a version of those for the Kalimantan field dialogue. I think what you can see on the screen there about linking uh, uh, the way that the agriculture, forestry and other land use sectors in Kalimantan mining in particular are thinking was one central element of what we were doing. We were trying to understand how uh, governments and communities and businesses in uh, central Kalimantan were responding to those uh, challenges and opportunities. Central Kalimantan, as you know, is a red plus pilot province. It's had a history of um, large scale development over the last 20 years and also has a strong history of indigenous and local rights. We were looking to learn about what of that experience we could take forward in the central Kalimantan context, but also what experience we could transfer elsewhere. And then part of our commitment in, in this dialogue that uh, uh, we were privileged to participate in was to bring the learning to this larger forum of uh, Forest Asia, but also into uh, other fora and processes such as the Global Landscape Forum uh, in December. The um, uh, process was co-chaired by, by five people. Um, I've introduced already Pak Jagal, the Dean of Agriculture at Palankarai University. He's the only co-chair who could be here. Peter Holmgren, the Director General of C4, had hoped to be here but is understandably caught up in a, a different meeting right now, so he sends his apologies. Uh, Malaga Navina from Mozambique, who heads an NGO there. Uh, Pavi uh, Sal... I can't do it. Pavi, who's got a Finnish surname, and I won't... Uh, I won't... Uh, thank you. Thank you. Finnish speakers. Um, from UPM, the large forestry company, and Matua Sirat from the World Agroforestry Centre. They were the co-chairs for our, for our process. Next slide, please. So, as I've said, we had 70 participants, about half of whom came from outside Indonesia. The other half were from Kalimantan and elsewhere in Indonesia. We spent two days in the field visiting a range of sites to illustrate different issues. Um, and we spent two days indoors in, in intense dialogue. There are a number of background papers. Some of, there are copies of some of those on the tables. There are copies on the memory stick and there are uh, downloads from the Forest Dialogue website. There's also um, what's called in the Forest Dialogue process the co-chair's summary. You have a draft copy of that. It's draft for a number of reasons. I left Pak Jagal's name off it. My apologies. Um, and because the co-chairs have yet to sign it off. But it'll give you a very good idea of the discussions we had and the conclusions we came to. So, to the next slide, please. Uh, one ticket at a time. Okay, thanks. Um, the outcomes of the dialogue were summarised by the co-chairs in um, six key messages. Uh, and at one level, these messages are, I think, no surprise to any of us who are engaged in thinking about landscapes and sustainable development. Uh, but at a, another level, the fact that they emerged from learning in the field, I think, underlines their importance. So the first of those was that we can only make the trade-offs that we have to make at a landscape, in a, in a particular landscape, in a particular social and economic context, in that context. We have to understand the context very clearly. Next, please. We also have to engage with the core social issues of recognising um, indigenous and local rights, of recognising uh, rights to uh, improvement of livelihoods, in recognising rights um, and interests over uh, governance at appropriate level. All of those considerations underpin truly sustainable development. Next. As Gary has just mentioned, as this uh, summit uh, more generally acknowledges, the private sector has to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. The dialogue between all actors, including the private sector actors, has to be real and meaningful 
and respectful. Next, thanks. Correspondingly, there's a very significant role for smallholders and for small to medium enterprises complementing that uh, of, uh, of the corporate scale private sector. Um, one of the speakers in this morning's um, uh, a panel discussion uh, spoke, I think, very clearly about this, about the complementary role of the corporate investor, corporate um, um, business, and that of smallholders and small to medium small to medium enterprises. Both are critically important. Next, please. All of what we're seeking to achieve can only be achieved where we have good governance. Uh, like any country, Indonesia is a complicated country in terms of governance, with a whole specific set of challenges occasioned by its political history, its political system, the um, nature of society here, just as any country is. And so that context has also to be understood and engaged with. Next. And uh, finally, we, the group felt that in, there, was, there was evidence in central Kalimantan, as there is elsewhere, that the, the, op, the, the impacts on environment and on livelihoods of particular development options had not really been thought through uh, as fully as it might need to be. And again, we heard one of the speakers in this morning panel reflect on that, reflect on the short-termism that we often see in decision-making versus a consideration of the impacts over the longer term. So that's a very short summary of four days of discussion and obviously a very, uh, very high level summary. Let me move on from that to invite um, a group of uh, colleagues who were participants in the dialogue to share briefly, very briefly, uh, their key learnings from that. Um, the order you see here is not necessarily the order that they're going to, to speak in. Um, so Sky Glende from the Climate uh, uh, Policy Institute, uh, Desi Kusumawadi, Dewey, is Desi made it into the room? Desi, there you are, thanks. Um, uh, Patera Patama from the Ministry of Forestry, uh, Sitra Rapati from the Ministry of Industry, um, uh, Eddie um, Pakedi Subhan. Subahani, um, uh, who represents um, uh, local community groups uh, in Kalimantan, and Pakjaga Yusurum um, from Palankarai University. So let me invite uh, Ibu Sitra um, to come and have the microphone. Oh, sorry, bring the microphone. Come here. This is good. Yeah. People can see you. You okay to stand here? Okay, thanks, sir. Ibu Sitra, yeah, you're welcome. Uh, terima kasih. Uh, first of all, I would like to introduce myself. My name is Citra Rapati. I represent uh, Director General Agro Industry, Ministry of Industry. Uh, I would like to thank uh, C4 for the wonderful four-day exp sharing experience for the food, uh, fuel, uh, fiber, and forest uh, dialogue. Uh, one of, uh, I think the biggest issue is, uh, for me as a representative of the government, is uh, how to have a coordination across the sectors. Uh, not only in the national levels, but also in the local level. So we we have the regulation, uh, as pa Putra mentioned in Palangkaraya, we have the one map uh, policy, ya, Pak, ya? Uh, and one map policy is really important. So if all the uh, stakeholders, not only the government, but also the private sectors, and also the academic, from, uh, like Pat Jago and friends from academics, I think we still have a better future of uh, how to use uh, our land, not only in Kalimantan, also in, uh, all around Indonesia. I think that the the uh, one thing that I remember the most from the dialogue that we have shared in uh, Palangkaraya for the fourth day. Thank you, Pak Peter. Thank you very much, Ibu. Ibu Desi, could I ask you next? Um, 
This is the four minutes. See how good that was? You got an extra minute from Citra. Hello, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I'm Desi Kusuma Dewi, uh, representing the RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. This is a multi stakeholders, uh, non for profit uh, association promoting the production and use of sustainable palm oil. As Gary mentioned uh, earlier, uh, we, it is uh, important to engage all the actors along the supply chain. So the RSPO memberships also comes from the palm oil supply chains, from the oil palm growers, right up to the consumer good manufacturers, retailers, palm oil processors and traders, as well as uh, banks and NGOs, environmental and social NGOs. Uh, the RSPO has developed a standard for sustainable palm oil production, and I'm very happy to share with you that Indonesia has been the largest producer of RSPO certified palm oil in the world at the moment. So my brief reflections from the uh, field visit in Palangkaraya, I think it was a very uh, good experience. It was very nice, uh, you know, um, being far away from the hustle and bustle of Jakarta. I have to thank my Secretary General for sending me to Palangkaraya for four days. It was very fruitful. And for me, I think it was a, a new lesson learned because then we also uh, 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 receive uh, perspectives from other sectors because probably my uh, focus of work uh, mainly on palm oil. So I think uh, being with uh, people from other sectors really open, uh, open up my mind that this is uh, indeed uh, 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 what's called uh, complex issues. Uh, this for uh, uh, for fees, yeah, and uh, palm oil. I think is only one small part of this. Um, uh, um, uh, what's called uh, full uh, uh, broad uh, context of the issues. Uh, so I take it. I took it positively, uh, uh, but also I think it was a scary moment to me. Because uh, my group, uh, we, we went and visited uh, this uh, fish, uh, 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 fisherman village and we went there uh, using this boat, small boat. And what scared me was because I couldn't uh, swim. So, so it was a scary moment, but uh, the rest of it is really very fruitful. So uh, that is my, my brief reflection. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ibu Daisy, you can see it made a very strong impression, but we did issue Ibu Daisy with a life jacket. Pak Patera, could I invite you please? Pak Patera from the Ministry of Forestry. Thank you, Daisy. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Uh, my name is Putra Pertama. As introduced, I'm representing the uh, Ministry of Forestry. And I was one of the participants in Palangkaraya, but unfortunately only for a half day. Uh, I missed the, uh, the field trip, so I could swim though. But, so <laughs> I missed that uh, field trip and missed most part of the discussion. But for us from the government, what's more important is to get the six conclusion presented by uh, Peter. Uh, and I'm going to uh, comment on a few, of, maybe not all of the uh, conclusions. Uh, actually, of those six points of conclusion, the, uh, the government cannot agree more. So we, we fully agree on those points, uh, and actually those points uh, were not out of sight so far from the government's uh, uh, view. I mean, I mean, we are fully aware of those points, and in fact, to some extent, we already engaged on the issues. And um, actually, we also integrate already in our policy making and some actions too. So um, it is true that the objective of uh, forestry development should not, uh, should not ever be isolated from the other sector's objective. In the past, maybe to some extent, to a lot of extent, we. Uh, we did that, but now we began to shift our paradigm toward 
putting uh, forestry objectives as part of the building block blocks uh, together with the other sector's objective to attain our uh, welfare. So that's why we we develop our national forestry plans uh, by involving and taking into account the consideration from other sectors. And according to our national plans, in 2030, uh, our forest is planned not to be 130 million hectares anymore. So we plan to reduce our forest land into 112 million hectares, meaning about 18 million hectares is to be allocated for other sectors, including for the uh, plantation, infrastructure, and others. And of the remaining 112 hectares, uh, it will also include about 6 million hectares for small scale uh, in a small scale plantation. So that's about the first, I think the first point. I would like to comment also on the point about the providing access to, uh, to the people, uh, to capital, providing capital access to people. It, it's really not a new, it's not a brand new issue for us. Uh, even in this very year, uh, the government is ready with, uh, can you remind me the, the number of, uh, well, about this, this very year, 500 billion Indonesian rupiahs is ready for the small scale uh, industry, small scale uh, plantation uh, with a very low uh, interest rate, it is a very soft loan and with a nine years uh, grace period. So it's, a, it's available, the, the capital is available for that. Uh, also decades ago, actually we have a program called Cook Das. It's also similar to that and billions of rupiah uh, disbursed for the people, community. But that program was failed in the sense that none of those money paid back to the government. Uh, so they are all gone, but maybe it's not a failure if you consider those who got the money already improved their uh, livelihood by getting that capital. So, uh, but uh, right now in the what we call BLU programs, it's not not that many uh, people very interested to get the money. So meaning that maybe it's not it's not really correct that. Uh, the lack of access to capital is uh, the problem. I believe, uh, I believe most of the problem, more, more of the problem is the lack of uh, human capacity in, in doing business. Because uh, capital is there, but no, uh, not, not so many people like to uh, be interested to get it. Although with a very low interest and not that uh, rigid requirement to get it. It's very easy just just establish a cooperative, a small cooperative that get so they can get the money. So, so uh, on other issue I cannot memorize the six point, maybe uh, one of it uh, on handling the social problem. Yeah we we also hundred percent agree that the handling correctly handling the social problem is the really good side for achieving sustainable forest management. And uh, we are doing uh, several things on that. Uh, at the present, the, the one I, I recall is we have a government regu a minister regulation on how handling partnership, uh, bridging between large scale in the, uh, enterprises, small scale, and the government. Government. It's a government. It's minister regulation number 39 to, in this year. So meaning uh, with that uh, regulation, actually, we would like to find win-win solution with uh, for any any uh, problems uh, related to land conflict uh, mostly. So uh, again, we cannot agree more. And uh, thank you very much for giving me chance to re respond on it. Thank you, Peter. Thank you very much, Patera.
the paper in the right order. Um, I'll ask the uh, next pack, uh, Oban, representing uh, the um, community-based forest management system working group and other local interests in uh, central Kalimantan to come to speak. Um, pak Oban will speak in Bahasa, Makasi, and I've asked Neil Franklin uh, from Damata, who collaborated with us in the uh, development of the field dialogue, to act as a translator. So we'll have a, a Pak uh, Oban will speak in Bahasa uh, a paragraph at a time, and Neil will, will has kindly offered to translate. Thank you, Pak. Uh, terima kasih. Assalamualaikum, salam sejahtera untuk kita semua. Uh, nama saya Uban, Uban Hajo. Biasa kalau kalau panjangnya di Subani. <tuh> saya berasal dari Palangkaraya, dari kelompok kerja sistem hutan kerakyatan. Bagaimana sejak tahun uh, 2000 kami sudah bekerja fasilitasi uh, masyarakat ya. Apologies in advance, Pak Uban, yeah, if my translation is not great to everybody else. So my name is Pak Uban from Palankaraya. I've been working since 2000, uh, the year 2000 in Palankaraya. And uh, the translation of your institute, Pak? Uh, institusi, yeah, bagaimana Pak? Institusi? Kelompok? Uh, dari Kelompok Kerja Sistem Hutan Kerakyatan, Poker Esaka. Yang dimana uh, kami bekerja uh, saat ini lebih banyak me uh, memetakan ya, memetakan wilayah-wilayah produksi masyarakat yang berada di dalam dan di uh, sekitar hutan. So one of our main focuses right now is to help with the mapping of uh, community interests in forest lands. Uh, dan harapannya juga peta-peta yang dilakukan oleh uh, uh, masyarakat saat ini itu bisa teridentifikasi. Bagaimana juga kalau kita berbicara soal penyelamatan hutan, kita bukan hanya berbicara soal hutannya saja. Dari poin-poin hasil uh, dialog, dari enam poin uh, yang dihasilkan di, pada bulan Maret yang lalu, perlu juga sebenarnya adalah uh, menyelamatkan kawasan-kawasan uh, produksi masyarakat yang berada di uh, kawasan hutan di HPK, hutan produksi yang bisa dikonversi dan di uh, APL, nah itu bagi kami adalah sesuatu yang terpenting dan itu uh, mestinya yang dilakukan uh, uh, untuk uh, ke depannya. So one of our main focuses right now to, to summarize a little there is in community interests on areas of forest land designated for conversion or forested lands outside the forest estate in multi-use development areas and that's where the main focus of work is right now. Uh, mungkin Ibu uh, saya Ibu Desi tadi menyamp uh, menyampaikan bahwa kunjungan di uh, beberapa hari di Kalimantan Tengah mungkin Ibu Desi mungkin senang tapi bagi kami yang ada di lokal uh, uh, tidak begitu uh, kunjungannya sebenarnya lebih kepada melihat yang uh, yang masih ada mestinya juga dilihat wilayah-wilayah terutama wilayah-wilayah uh, konflik ya wilayah konflik antara masyarakat dengan uh, perkebunan kelapa sawit juga itu perlu dilihat juga sebenarnya. So whilst others on the trip uh, during the dialogue enjoyed themselves and there's lots of positive things, at least from the perspective of local interests and community interest groups, it was perhaps at times frustrating and not all of the issues were covered, particularly issues relating to oil palm and uh, community smallholder agriculture in forested areas and conflicts related to that. Uh, tapi di kunjungan di lapangan kemarin ada ada baiknya juga sebenarnya bagaimana juga uh, melihat inisiatif inisiatif uh, masyarakat uh, pemerintah di desa menyelamatkan kawasan-kawasan hutan yang tersisa ya di daerah uh, bagian hilir bagaimana uh, mereka inisiatif dengan melakukan uh, uh, penyelamatan hutan melalui salah satunya melalui hutan desa dan juga penyelamatan penyelamatan wilayah produksi produksi pangan masyarakat di di sekitar uh, desa. On the positive side, we did we did see examples of activities related to community forests, hutan desa, and forests managed by communities mixed with food crops, uh, other smallholder livelihood models related to small scale locally based community forestry. Uh, untuk harapannya ke depan, harapannya uh, bagi uh, kita yang ada di sini untuk bisa pertama adalah bersama-sama 
untuk uh, saya sampaikan tadi menyelamatkan wilayah-wilayah produksi pangan masyarakat yang saat ini sebenarnya uh, ancamannya di eh, dikonversi ya dikonversi menjadi uh, beberapa wilayah perkebunan karena untuk isu RDD sendiri investasi pada Uh, mengurangi aktivitas mereka berada di hutan uh, produksi dan hutan lindung tapi ancaman yang terbesar bagi kami adalah uh, kawasan-kawasan produksi uh, pangan masyarakat itu berada di HPK dan di APL so one of our concerns is that much of the areas currently used by communities for food and for growing crops is in the areas of forest land designated for conversion or in areas outside of forest otherwise threatened and so much of the focus, the hope for the future is that the focus will look more closely at these areas uh, in, in forest lands threatened for conversion currently used by communities both for forestry and for agricultural uses. Dan itulah sebenarnya inisiatif kami sejak tahun dua, uh, 2010 mencoba untuk mengidentifikasi kawasan-kawasan produksi uh, masyarakat yang tersisa saat ini dan coba untuk uh, didorong kepada pengambil kebijakan untuk masuk ke dalam rencana tata ruang uh, kabupaten dan uh, provinsi. So one of our focus is, uh, is particularly on this and since 2010 we've been looking uh, to identify identify these areas where communities have uh, are using utilizing forest lands for their livelihoods and for agriculture. Oke, okay, sebagai penutup uh, untuk kedepannya saya tegaskan lagi bagaimana nanti uh, kita bersama bisa mendialogkan, mendiskusikan lagi penyelamatan hutan-hutan yang tersisa ini berkaitan dengan wilayah wilayah produksi pangan ya selain wilayah-wilayah uh, uh, wilayah hutan yang tersisa kalau wilayah hutan tersisa mungkin masih bisa kesema, di, bisa kita selamatkan tapi yang terpenting adalah menyelamatkan wilayah uh, produksi wilayah produksi pangan masyarakat yang berada di hutan produksi yang bisa dikonversi dan di area penggunaan lainnya oke okay. But I think the, the main focus for the work into the future uh, is that uh, we must pay more attention to these areas of forest land and conversion forests and forested areas outside of the forest estate, uh, which are currently utilized for livelihoods and for food by communities. But my apologies if I, if I make a mistake in translation. Terima okay. kasih. Thank you very much. We have two more speakers and we're going to move to a short, small group discussion. Um, the penultimate speaker, Pak Jagar, uh, our uh, co-chair and field dialogue host. Makasi. Let me speak here because I want to see my daughter. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Selamat sore Bapak Ibu sekalian. As uh, requested by the Forest Dialogue through Shodik, I have to respond the six conclusion, key conclusion of the TFD in Pangkaraya. So, according to the six key conclusion from the TFD in Pangkaraya six weeks ago, would like to respond some point. First, in terms of uh, uh, the, fourth, the fourth conclusion, uh, in terms of the in terms of development of uh, business opportunity for small holder and uh, SM enterprise in sustainable landscape. In Central Kalimantan, our uh, local people feel that the economic development, which use the natural resources for forest conservation, for example. Uh, plantation and mining only give small benefit to them. So, everything from uh, university perspective, we have to help the local people to get better benefit from the development in the development. Uh, now, we have uh, a partnership between University of Lankaraya and CPI. Sky will explain detail later. CPI and Climate Policy Initiative to provide uh, technical assistance to support Central Kalimantan government on land use and green growth issues. We call the initiative uh, Production and Protection Initiative. From this collaboration, CPI 
has been established uh, a center of excellence in, in University of Lang Raya with strong and local technical capacity that can support the government of Central Kalimantan on the land use issues. We named the center of uh, the center as Pilar. Pilar is Palangkaraya Institute for Land and Agriculture Research, which uh, the tagline is supporting sustainable development. So Pilar is support. Uh, we conduct some research focus, uh, namely land uses, including natural ecosystem and other current and plant land use, Central Kalimantan. Also, socioeconomics and business model and, and fiscal flow. You can see in the leaflet uh, in front of you. And we should ensure land use for indigenous. Sorry. What's the my note? Socioeconomic. Okay. Regarding to the business model for small solder, uh, in terms of uh, the fourth uh, conclusion, uh, we also conduct an analysis for developing a business model that support uh, Central Kalimantan Green Growth Plan focus on investment in sustainable and high productivity of palm oil. So through this collaboration between UPA and CDI, we want to know the business model that appropriate in Central Kalimantan, which engage smallholder and local people in Central Kalimantan, especially in palm oil business. Uh, the second uh, response, second comment from our point of view is uh, in uh, social issues. In, 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 in Central Kalimantan context, in terms of social issues, to realizing a sustainable development objective that give a better impact to local people, indigenous people, and smallholder, we should ensure land tenure for indigenous people and smallholder. As we know, in Central Kalimantan, our government has issued regulation about customary land rights that give authority to the customary leader to issue customary land title. This policy has created uh, some conflict in the ground because uh, there is no criteria for deciding whether a land customary land as customary uh, customary land or not. So I think uh, that uh, this issue needs to be addressed in this dialogue: how to recognize the customary right, how to resolve the land tenure issues, and how to measure the conflict. Uh, that's it to comment from me and the detail we are talking about this guy. Thank you. Kasadanya Akdagal. And last speaker, um, who has that slot because she's very concise, Sky Glenda from Climate Policy Institute. Sky. Uh, thanks, Gary and Peter, and thank you also to Fletcher Gow and everyone. I don't think I need to explain too much more detail because you already did a very good job at explaining all the work we have together in Central Kalimantan. So, as Peter said, my name is Sky Glenda, I'm with the Climate Policy Initiative. Uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with our organisation, we are an analysis and advisory group that works with uh, government and local knowledge partners like this part uh, in key countries around the world on land use and energy policies, but with a particular focus on the economics uh, behind transitioning those uh, to more sustainable systems. So I think there's three points that I just wanted to emphasise uh, that for me were important themes of the dialogue and also of our work here in Indonesia. Uh, I think the first is that as we think about frameworks for sustainable land use or landscapes, um, from CPI's perspective, it's very important that the models that we develop um, to implement this on the ground, really deliver growth in the rural economy. Um, so, including through increasing productivity in important commodities like palm oil. Without uh, delivering economic growth, uh, we really don't think the, the change and the shift towards sustainability will occur because governments, business and communities won't be able to afford uh, more sustainable land use patterns that lead to conservation of natural capital. 
So that, that's yeah. number one. I think number two is uh -huh. that uh, to actually deliver on these landscapes, we really think that a coalition of actors is necessary. And I think uh, Gary highlighted this in his overview of the forest dialogue as well that really it, it takes uh, different roles of governments, business, and communities to deliver on an integrated landscape. So it's, it's actually looking at the strengths of uh, those different actors and what the right roles for them are to play in managing the landscape sustainably. And for us, I think that actually makes a jurisdictional approach a very important approach in Indonesia because a jurisdiction like a district is a level where government can really uh, take a role and deliver on policy, uh, business can perform at scale and it also includes communities in the small home side of the private sector. I, I think there's a parallel session on, on jurisdictional approaches today as well. And I think the third point for us is that it's really important that uh, these models, frameworks, solutions to the land use challenges are really locally owned and led. Uh, so CPI is not out here determining the best approach for Indonesia, but we're partnering with people like Pak Dogao who do the local context much better and supporting him to establish a sense of excellence, uh, supporting local researchers to analyse the challenges in those four areas, the land use, social, business and fiscal challenges, to, to try to design together that integrated model. I think one uh, reflection I had specifically on the discussion we had in Central Cali Montan was that throughout the uh, field trips and the, and the dialogue, it came up repeatedly that uh, a lot of actors in government, business and communities are really finding it challenging to deliver on, I guess, the expanding number of standards that there are related to sustainable development. And I think something important that could come out of uh, the dialogue through for us Asian people broadly and ongoing conversations between people in this room is how do we really streamline some of those standards uh, and identify the right roles of government, business and communities in simplifying these sustainability issues. So how do we uh, draw on the strength of things like RSPO, ISPO, uh, there's Red Plus safeguards, HCV, HES, how do we actually determine what should happen at the different uh, levels of those actors within the jurisdiction and come up with an integrated landscape approach, which I think is, is what we're discussing in the forest model. And I was also asked to comment on what our uh, commitments are going forward because I think that's part of the, the dialogue that will be happening in the next part of the session. And so I guess from CPI's perspective, really our commitment is to support and strengthen local institutions like what Jagar mentioned, Pula, that have been established in Central Valley all time, and to look for other local platforms. And I guess aside from just doing the research and analysis, which really will provide the evidence base for developing these new frameworks, I think a very important component of our cooperation in Central Valley Montan is that it's very action oriented. So we work with Pat Dogao and the team at Pula to understand the current situation by doing this analysis. But then Pat Dogao is also the chair of a working group uh, that the government has established that sits above uh, that centre of excellence. That working group includes academics like Pat Dogao, but the key government uh, ministries. It also includes important uh, community organisations from the Diet Council, important industry representatives from GAPGI and also CSO partners and that really is a multi-stakeholder forum that the university can provide advice on options for going forward and that local group of stakeholders uh, really has the, the knowledge to develop locally informed solutions to actually carry out and implement this model on the ground. So for us it's not just about doing the research but having that platform that we can actually take action together through the next step. So I think that's all. Thank you very much, Sky, and thanks to all the panelists. Can we go to the next slide, please? So, thanks. So, to all of those panelists, thank you for those perspectives. We're now going to move to um, uh, a stage of the um, session which is uh, interactive. We're going to invite you to participate in a discussion around. One of these six topics, these are the six topics um, there on the table. Everybody should have a, be able to have a copy of the matrix. And in the columns of the matrix, we have, as uh, Sky just alluded to, the three areas of commitment that the Forest Asia Summit is seeking to catalyse. Uh, commitment to priority research topics, commitment to uh, investments in sustainable development, 
and commitments to dialogue to um, reconcile the different uh, perspectives and priorities of different interest groups. So, uh, next slide, please. Uh, skip on. Yeah. Um, we're being adaptive, as the forest dialogue has to be. We're going to finish by seven. So, although the guidelines say two priority topics, well, I think we're going to have time for one to do justice to it. So, um, uh, what we're asking you to do is to self-associate um, with a topic of your choice. And can I get to the next slide? Uh, forget that because we'll come back to it in a minute. Okay. So, uh, could I, you've just heard from Sky. Okay. So, if you're interested in addressing core social issues, Sky, come and join Sky at this table. Gary, you've heard from. If you're interested in talking about engaging with the private sector, come and join Gary over in this corner. If you're interested in better governance, Pak Patera, man of government, is going to facilitate the discussion. Please come and join him. Um, business opportunities for smallholders, which we've just heard a lot about. Dominic, welcome. Thanks. You'll have to find a different table, maybe the one back a bit. Okay, so Dominic, you haven't heard from Dominic, here he is in the red shirt, he'll be leading that group, and I'm here and I'll find a spot down in that corner for anybody who'd like to talk about the impacts of production systems. Uh, if you are more comfortable, so these groups will be in English, not in Australian and not in Bahasa, but in English. Okay. If you're more comfortable speaking in Bahasa, that's fine, form a group in the middle, um, and, and have that conversation in Bahasa and we'll hear from your discussion in the reporting back. Can I go back a slide, please? Okay, so forget about the second session there. We don't have time for the second session. What we have time for is 20 minutes sharply focused discussion on the topic of your choice. So back to the last slide. Okay, so have a look at that. Um, could I have the facilitators stand up? and migrate to their respective area of the room. So I'm going to migrate down the back corner. Neil, did I leave you out? Excuse me. Neil Franklin, who you've heard from already, um, forests and forestry in the wider context. So you're going to go just to the left there somewhere, Neil. OK, excuse me. OK, so please join that group. We'll have a short discussion for 20 minutes, a brief reporting back, and we'll finish by 7. Okay, so private sector Gary Dunning here, forestry in the wider context, Neil Franklin over there, government, governance, Pak Patera here, core social issues, Sky over there, smallholders, Dominic, and production systems will be me and I'll go down the back corner near the technical section. without committing to who might do it, uh, is, is in the work of definition on things like smallholders uh, and SMEs. There's one important point that came out here was, we heard earlier somebody say, to what extent can the, uh, the SMEs and smallholders complement the private sector? Which we thought was a bit weird, because of course smallholders are the private sector. Um, the largest private sector in Indonesia is actually smallholders. Um, so it's a massive great private sector that already, so th this idea that it needs to be forced into complementing something else, 
uh, I think is the wrong language. So we're looking at the way, how do we define properly our terms here, what we're talking about, and question some preconceptions uh, that already exist about smallholders and about the SME sector um, as well. So those, that was one important point. And on investment, um, yeah, sure, you know, that there's, there's money around, as we've heard, uh, from, uh, from government, through the BLU, uh, and other sources of money, but how can we connect that down to smallholders when we know there are so many difficulties in creating these layers of creating social capital, uh, improving capacity, and making that work. So that in itself means it's not just an investor, you need a constellation, you need a combination of investors combined with other actors that are working together uh, in order to release this particular sector. And even in government, uh, our colleague here from the Ministry of Forestry, you know, the interest of talking across sectors within government, for instance with the Ministry of Finance, who have an interest in this area, then how could we find a way of releasing the BLU and managing it in a way that, that's using real evidence to see how that could work on the ground? And so there's some facilitation that's, uh, that still needs to happen um, at, that, um, at that level. So what we know is that there's certainly lots of appetite for investment, there's money sitting in these various areas, but actually how you can then release it down to the smallholder level uh, is a, is a non-trivial task. It's, a, it's an extremely complicated one. Thank you very much. Can we come to the private sector number two? That's Gary. Absolutely. So we, uh, we didn't necessarily follow the matrix, which we know that in the traditional TFD way, we uh, forged our own path. And what we looked at really was a simplification of the question, which is how do you engage the private sector? What are the biggest challenges? Um, how do you address that? We had a rich discussion. Uh, it was good. I would distill it out into three key points about um, three key actions that you need to effectively engage the private sector. Um, one is the neutral convener or a convener that is trusted um, by private sector actors. So you need to have the right, um, the right people, not only at the table, but the people asking to bring them at the table. Um, one of the biggest motivators, so what is the motivator that, that usually brings the private sector to the table and that is managing risk or looking for opportunity, um, depending on how you look at it. So private sector is motivated. Um, So, uh, managing risk, uh, and, and that's one of the key things, you know, somebody else might create the risk, but we can provide the opportunity or we can help manage that risk. And a sub, sub point of that was, who are the organizations, individuals, um, firms that the private sector will turn to in that process of helping them manage the risk, and that's key. And third point is related to the second point, which is, um, there has to be a strong business case uh, that brings the private sector to the table. So the business case has to be developed. You have to speak the language of the private sector to be able to engage with them. So those were the, the key points that we had in the table. Thank you. Peter. Um, I would like to start with two apologies. First, uh, um, I'm not a good facilitator. Being from the government, I'm more used to being facilitated rather than facilitating. <laughs> and second, uh, we didn't uh, we didn't hear uh, your instruction very well. So we focus only on one one issue instead of two or three. So uh, it's the issue is on uh, creating more effective and better coordinated government across its levels of government and different sectors. So uh, the discussion was very, uh, very good. On research, uh, we identified that uh, we need the research on land use, of course. Uh, actually, many research have been done, but the problem is there is a gap between research uh, output and policy making. So, um, uh, it's a, it's a problem of communication uh, and also there is a need to find a new way of dialogue to, uh, in order to facilitate cross-sectoral uh, stakeholders 
And in this case, uh, we think that what has been done in Kalpalangkaraya by CPI uh, worth uh, replicating in other parts of the country. And there is also a need for research on, on regulations uh, because in Indonesia there are many regulations on its level of govern governance and uh, most of them are contra some of them contradictive each other so we need the research to harmonize uh, that uh, regulations. Um, on investment, uh, we think in order to have a better coordination and uh, coordination across sector and across levels, uh, what we need to invest is actually time, uh, energy, and uh, to some extent also infrastructure on communication. Uh, we need to convene uh, multi-sectoral and multi-agency uh, meeting, dialogues, in order to uh, have a better coordination. So, so that's uh, the investment we need. Uh, actually, in Indonesia, there is a, a nice system already for coordination, uh, which we call the Mus Renbang system. We start from Philips uh, Renbang up to the uh, national Renbang, but uh, somehow uh, it doesn't. The system is, uh, it doesn't work very well. But there is a good example actually in Nusa Tenggara Timur, mentioned by our colleagues, uh, where it worked. So. Um, meaning something must be done uh, on that. NGO involvement is very uh, instrumental uh, in order to make uh, more participation from civil society. And also, uh, we need to make sure formal representatives of stakeholders on, on each more Renbang to uh, convey the needs of the stakeholders. And with regard to dialogue, uh, we need uh, dialogues to identify the needs of local people and communicate uh, those needs to different levels of governments. And we also need the dialogue on uh, strategic issues uh, from uh, on different levels of governments. Uh, we need to, uh, we actually have a uh, system also, uh, coordin coordinating minister. We have a uh, other, other institutions uh, to facilitate that, but if you have forum does, if somebody recall, uh, but uh, we need to revitalize this all. So, I think, I think that's uh, what we got from our discussion. Uh, thank you very much, Peter. Thank you, Park, for somebody who doesn't facilitate very often. You followed the instructions exactly and uh, <laughs> wrung a lot of information out of your table. So, I think, I think you've got another calling as a facilitator, if you'd like. Sky. I'm actually a little bit embarrassed because I didn't facilitate anywhere near as well, I don't think. Um, I'll try to briefly summarise. Our group was focused on discussing uh, the core social issues to create enabling conditions for landscape approaches. And so I think there were two kind of broad focal areas of our discussion on the issue. The first really comes back to the land ownership issue. Um, so what social conflicts are there between communities and, and companies working in central Kalimantan? Uh, how progressed is the process that's underway to uh, award Adat or Indigenous rights in central Kalimantan so that they're actually clearly recognised and, and demarcated? Um, and I think also relating to land ownership was an element of uh, land use planning, so ensuring that land uh, not only recognised uh, social community issues, but was actually allocated into the right, the right uses, um, which made the way the Indonesian system works makes different ownership categories uh, applicable if it's under the right spatial planning allocation. I think the other side of uh, issues we had we had a good discussion on the role of youth in in the communities in Central Kalimantan. Um, so in terms of access to job markets or benefits that they were receiving uh, from different enterprises uh, being, being carried out in the province and I think identified the need for further investigation into that area and um, building that into any further action and policies. More broadly also just the issue of benefit sharing for communities 
um, and the need to the need to further address that uh, in policies going forward. And then I think uh, the third point was really, uh, I guess, coming back to basic fundamental social engagement, but really that in Central Kali Matan there's been a lot of historic challenges in terms of engaging communities in new enterprises as they were developed. And so, you know, not only in terms of engaging them in the business structures that are put in place, but in the, in the research, analytical investment and dialogue processes going forward, that, that that's a key, a key consideration. So I think they're the three uh, topic areas that we covered, but uh, given the institutions around the table, we didn't necessarily have people uh, researching, <coughs> investing, or conducting. Thank you. Thank you very much. And then Samson in the last group. Thanks, Samson. Hi. Our group set out to look at the environmental impacts of uh, different production systems, but we quickly found out from the rich audience at the table that we couldn't really talk about that without looking at land tenure rights and secure land tenure for both local and concession holders. So we had a few examples from the table from the German uh, Development Corporation representative, from the IPCC representative, some researchers and some people from the National Park and the University. And we got to hear that there's ongoing conflict in many of these concessions as well as the uh, local communities on access to economic products as well as non-economic products, so the NTFPs. And there is an ongoing conflict that has been going on for years and there are different underlying issues that relate to both research, investment and dialogue. So our group, we wanted to come up with three points, each for the research, investment and dialogue, but we came up with two points. And the main point in, uh, regarding research is how to do a to do a kind of comparative study on the CO2 profiles of land use change regarding uh, local communities, uh, production systems, and land use change uh, from, <coughs> from land use change from concession holders. <coughs> that was the main uh, research uh, point we came up uh, uh, under um, under research, and we found that. In the dialogue phase, there needs to be some kind of institutionalized uh, conflict resolution between local and and the concession holders, and we were debating based on the diversity of, of the audience: can this be done by the Ministry of Forestry? Can this be done by local NGOs or local uh, customer leaders, or, and so on and so forth? And our third point, which kind of relates to investment, but is not an investment investment. Uh, issue is before any of this research and conflict uh, dialogue can take place for sustainable development, there needs to be some kind of uh, uh, secure tenor rights for both, uh, especially for local people. Yeah. Thank you, Samson. Thank you, everybody. Uh, thank you, facilitators. That brings this um, session to a close. We've closed more or less right on the time we promised to. Didn't achieve our aspiration of finishing early, but uh, as uh, some of you commented, that's because the discussion takes a little while to, to warm up. Um, I'd like to thank um, our panellists who contributed their learning from the four days of field dialogue. I'd like to thank you all as participants in this mini dialogue um, for contributing um, your time at the end of a long day uh, and your ideas. We'll capture those uh, as best we can. We'll take them back to the meeting tomorrow and we'll incorporate them into the next stage of the 4X dialogue stream as part of our learning uh, from engagement in Indonesia. So I thank you for your commitment of time and energy uh, and we'll do our best to ensure that we do justice to that carry it forward. Um, with that, I think I can uh, on behalf of C4 and the Forest Dialogue and our other partners, Damata, CPI, University of uh, Panakaraya, the Government of Central Kalimantan, thank you again. Um, look forward to continuing to engage with you in these very important issues uh, and um, say um, Salat Malam, more or less. There, there are still two sessions running for those of you who've got energy. 
one on genetic resources and one for youth, which disqualifies some of us, but others of you are qualified. So if you have energy and you'd like to participate in yet another session, please feel free to do so. Uh, otherwise, look forward to seeing you uh, back for day two of the summit tomorrow. Thanks again and please join me in uh, thanking us all for your participation.